Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, an interview with Dr. Ian Fairley, a British scientist and researcher, who explains that how radiation is measured matters. And there's a real difference between the gold standard currently in use, known as linear no threshold, and pressures on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to change it into something based on junk, I put the word science in quotes in calling it junk science, that touts that radiation is good for you. Well, it's not. And Ian Farrelly helps you understand and get it right. Then we talk with Eiji Oguma, a Japanese professor of sociology and history, who made the film Tell the Prime Minister about Japan's anti-nuclear movement. In large part, he did so by editing together YouTube videos he had permission to use and joined them with interviews he conducted, including with one of the prime ministers. Plus, everybody's favorite, numbnuts of the week, for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness, the nuclear reactor duck and cover report on what's gone wrong this week with those aging rust buckets, and more honest nuclear information than anyone I walk my dog with wants to hear from me ever again. I know I try, I just can't help myself. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, October 18, 2016, and here's the week's nuclear news from a different perspective. In Japan, a man labeled a nuclear skeptic, meaning a person inclined to question or doubt all accepted opinions, has won the race to govern the Japanese prefecture with the biggest nuclear power facility. Ryuichi Yoniyama, a 49-year-old doctor who has never held public office, beat a former construction ministry official su supported by Prime Minister Shinzo Abebebe's ruling coalition to become governor of Niigata Prefecture, home of TEPCO's Kashiwazaki Kariwa nuclear power plant. Mr. Yoniyama said, I will not allow a restart under the current circumstances, as I couldn't guarantee your life and your standards of living. Hoo A new survey by Asahi Shimbun found that 57% of citizens nationwide are against restarting nuclear power plants, nearly double the 29% who want reactors brought back online. The telephone survey was conducted on October 15 and 16 of this year. And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. Tokyo Electric Power Company, operators of the nuclear power reactors that were destroyed in the Fukushima disaster five years ago, has asked Japan's government for help in avoiding the risk of the utility going bankrupt should there be a sharp rise in the full estimated cleanup costs. First of all, should there be an increase in estimated cleanup costs? There are always going to be increases in nuclear costs. That's what nuclear is about. They keep pushing the price up and up and up, and we keep stopping them the money a little at a time and a little, actually a lot at a time. And it doesn't matter whether the rising cost is sharp or dull. It always increases. Like that pot of cold water that the frogs are in, and before you know it, they are boiling in a pot of frog soup. Now, TEPCO's president says that they're not seeking a bailout. They just want to avoid bankruptcy. In other words, give us the money. Japanese taxpayer money out of the government. The Manichi newspaper said on Wednesday, October 12th, that Japan's utilities lobby expects that cleanup and compensation costs from the Fukushima disaster will overshoot previous estimates by 8.1 trillion yen, or $79 billion American. 
But that's just the current estimate because, you know, in another couple of years, they're going to be asking for even more, and it will never end. And that's why Tokyo Electric Power and every organization and institution that enables your ongoing nuclear dysfunction, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. According to a report from super activist Deun Renard, a.k.a. Hervé Cotois, in Japan, the 7-Eleven mini markets in Japan are selling Fukushima rice mixed with other rices to lower the contamination measuring and to facilitate its sale. A sample of this rice was processed and then measured with a germanium semiconductor detector at the University of Tokyo, and results are, to quote the phrase here, to be worried about. And Japanese photographer Aiko Sato has a picture of a one-eyed frog, as well as other deformities and mutations in insects, reptiles, and birds. This from the documentary film Paradise Phantom, which has just come out. In the U.S., the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP site, near Carlsbad, New Mexico, has had three collapses of its underground ceiling in the last month. So rather than fix the problem, the Fed suggests that a section of the government's only underground nuclear waste repository be permanently sealed. Energy Secretary Ernest Moni Modis has gone on record saying that WIP will be open again for operation by the end of December, a mere two and a half months away. Any bets? Anyone holding their breath? The Arizona Department of Environmental Quality has issued three air quality permits for three uranium mines in or adjacent to the Grand Canyon National Park. And at the Indian Point reactors in New York, after the September 30th oil spill, a visual inspection revealed rusted and broken containment systems in and along the discharge canal, which suggests that the infrastructure at Indian Point may be inadequate to prevent contaminant releases into the Hudson River. Since 2011, there have been over 40 four zero spills and unexpected shutdown events at Indian Point Nuclear Reactor which is only 30 miles from Midtown Manhattan. Give my regards to Broadway. Today's featured interview is with Dr. Ian Fairley. He is an independent consultant on radioactivity in the environment living in the UK. Ian has studied radiation and radioactivity since the Chernobyl accident in 1986. He received his doctorate from Princeton on the radiological hazards of nuclear fuel reprocessing and from 2000 to 2004 was head of the Secretariat of the UK Government's Committee on Internal Radiation Risks. He has been a consultant on radiation matters to the European Parliament, local and regional governments, environmental NGOs, and private individuals. Dr. Fairley joined me via Skype from his home in London. This interview was originally recorded for Nuclear Hot Seat number 217 on August 18, 2015. Dr. Ian Fairley is an independent consultant on radioactivity in the environment living in London, UK. He has studied radiation and radioactivity since the Chernobyl accident in 1986. He received his doctorate from Princeton on the radiological hazards of nuclear fuel reprocessing and from 2000 to 2004 was head of the Secretariat of the UK Government's SERI Committee on Internal Radiation Risks. He has been a consultant on radiation matters to the European Parliament, local and regional governments, environmental NGOs, and private individuals. He's also been a guest several times on Nuclear Hot Seat and we welcome him always. He joined me via a less-than-cooperative Skype from his home in London. Ian Fairley, it is always a pleasure to have you here on Nuclear Hot Seat. It's my pleasure to live in. Let's start out with the basics. Explain to the listeners what the linear no-threshold model is for determining radiation's impact and effect on us. Yeah, what it means is that as you reduce the radiation dose, by a factor of two, then the results, the effects will be reduced by a factor of two. 
In other words, as you go down, the relationship between dose and effect is linear. It doesn't go up and down like a yo-yo. It's straightforwardly linear, straight line. That's the first part of the LMT. The second part of the linear no threshold is the fact that there is no save threshold. In other words, no matter how low you go, there's a little risk. The only safe dose is zero. The reason why there's so much argument uh, and exchange of views about the linear no threshold is that as you go down lower and lower and lower and lower, People think, well, there must be a safe level, but there isn't. It means that you're always going to be have an effect. And the fact that there is no safe level upsets a lot of people. It really does. Let me give you an example of what I mean by low doses. If you were to take, say, a thousand people and give them each one millisievert of radiation, that's a small dose of radiation, we know from all of the research work that we've done that about 10 people out of those 1,000 would later die from a cancer. It would be 10 fatal cancers. But the thing is, we don't know which 10 people. All that would happen is, and this is a good way of understanding it, is that each of those 1,000 people would be given a negative lottery ticket. Now, your readers will be familiar with lottery tickets. Many of them will buy lottery tickets and you'll get 10 tickets and you'll hope that one of them will win. Well, what happens here is that if you get a dose of radiation, then you are given a negative or unlucky lottery ticket, and your number may come up. might not, but it might. Here's another example. Many people of our age used to smoke a long time ago, and all our friends used to smoke. Um, some people die from lung cancer, but other people didn't. In other words, there was a bit of a lottery here. Sometimes you got it, sometimes you didn't. It's the same with radiation. Some people are going to get it, others don't. And we don't really know why. All we can do is give you the number who will die. And radiation doses are cumulative over time. So yes. if someone gets a millisievert in a year and doesn't develop cancer that does not preclude the millisievert they get the following year and the year after that and the year after that Correct. accumulating Correct. so that they have a greater impact on health. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed, all of us in the world get background levels of radiation, right? And we can work out the number of people who will die from background radiation because it so happens that the amount of background radiation we get, say, I'm just going to talk about gamma right now, not alpha from radon, but each of us gets about a millisievert a year of background radiation. So if you live to, say, you're 90, you get 90 millisieverts of background radiation. And that does involve a risk, and people will die from it. Indeed, quite a few radiation scientists think that radiation is linked with aging. It's part of the reason why we're not immortal, why we die. The key thing is this, is that um, as we age, we can tell that our bodily functions, our livers, our kidneys, our skin, our brains, all deteriorate. And the reason why they deteriorate is because partly it has to do with the yearly insult of background radiation. It damages the cells. They're not able to reproduce as quickly as, or as effectively as they used to. It kills cells sometimes. And the result is, we age. And that's one of the reasons why we die. It's not the only reason, by the way. There are viruses, there are colds, there are infections, there are trauma, I mean, car accidents, etc. Et but, I mean, these sort of bacterial and viral infections, they are sort of like one-offs. We get a cold, and then a week or two later, we're okay. But with background radiation, it's all the time, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I had a question about background radiation for a while, and maybe you can answer this. Okay. We seem to assume that background radiation is always there and always has been as a constant. But I'm wondering if there was ever a measurement that was taken or that we can discern from before 1945 when atmospheric bombs were being blown up 
so that radiation levels were increased. And do we know a rate at which this background radiation has increased as we have moved through the first 70 years of the nuclear era? That's a good question. I don't know the answer. I don't know of extant evidence measuring background radiation before, say, 1945. I'd have to go back and, and work it out. However, there are studies which measure the amount of radioactive fallout from the atmospheric test bomb. If you go back to the early reports of UNSCEAR, UNSCEAR stands for United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, you can find older reports which discuss the amount of radioactivity in the air. Now, that is, doesn't fully answer your question. You talk about dose. And getting from radioactivity, say from cesium and strontium, to dose is very complicated. But you can get a proxy on it. Your next question is, how much has that increased? It certainly has increased, but I would have to go back to my and crack open the books to figure out by how much. Can I give you another little anecdote? And that is this. When they are making radiation meters, detection equipment for radioactivity and radiation, they have to use metals which have got very, very low amounts of cesium and strontium in them, right? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise they screw up the readings, right? It's going to skew the results, yeah. Exactly, right. And you know where they get the metal for that? No. From World War I battleships sunk up on the north of Scotland after the end of the First World War. German battleships, but they were scuttled up a place called Scapa Flow. And they go down there and they get this, this steel from that. It's very expensive. And use it in order to get what they call low background steel. That's the only way they can trust that it hasn't been yeah. contaminated yeah. by radiation. Yeah. yeah, because it's been at the bottom of the sea since 1918. So let's keep going with this to understand the compare and contrast. You've talked a little bit about linear no threshold, and we can get back to that. But in contrast... What are the hormesis people saying? By the way, I usually say hormesis, no, horusis for believing and talking about this as though it's something credible. But anyway, <laughs> we can drop that bad joke for now. And what is hormesis theory saying, and where in the world does this thing come from? In the 1950s and 1960s, there were a lot of radiation biology experiments in cell cultures and on little... Uh, lab animals like rats and mice, that they were done to figure out what the effects of radiation were. Some of those studies showed, some by the way, not all, maybe about a quarter of them, showed that if you gave a tiny little dose to these lab animals and then followed it up later, say an hour later, with a bigger dose, like say, you start off with a little tickle dose of one millisievert and then gave them one sievert, a thousand times bigger, and looked at the results, you would find that the cells or the mice who had received a tickle dose did better than the mice who had not received a tickle dose. Right? That's really obscure, but okay. It's not all that surprising. There is evidence for that in chemistry as well. But the it's key thing is this. It's irrelevant for radiation protection. Let me tell you why. All of us, again, it comes down to background radiation. All of us get tickle doses every day of the week, every day of the year. Does that mean that we're therefore protected from other doses of radiation coming in the future? Well, how would we tell? <laughs> I mean, the point is that we're all, we're, all of us are exposed to it. Another way of looking at it is this. We know from experience or from, not from experience, actually from a lot of studies, epidemiological studies, that background radiation itself is harmful. And there's quite a few studies showing that now. We know, for example, that about 20% perhaps of all background cases of leukemia are due to radiation. Some people think it may be even all background cases of leukemia. Leukemia occurs in children naturally. There's a natural occurrence rate. And some scientists think that part or all of those is due to background radiation. So that knocks this, this whole theory of radiation being good for you right on its head. It just makes a nonsense of it. 
Here's another example. Most people don't get big doses of radiation, okay? The only place where I can think of where people deliberately get big doses of radiation is in radiation therapy. In other words, those people who need to get high radiation doses to deal with a thyroid cancer or a big lump in their brain or a tumor or somewhere or other. Those people, the people who are receiving radiation therapy, do get big doses, right? Do we give them a little tickle beforehand? No, we don't. Of course we don't. If you were to mention that to therapists who work in the hospital, they would think you're crazy. We don't do it. Or here's another example. Think about nuclear workers who work in nuclear power stations. They're exposed to relatively high levels of radiation. Instead of getting a millisievert a year, which is the background rate, they may get a millisievert every two weeks, something like that. Do they show that they are more protected? No, they don't. They show a healthy worker effect, but they show the healthy worker effect for everything, whether it's asbestos levels, whether it's dioxin levels or whatever. Ordinary workers are cut above the frail people who are old or sensitive people who are young. So apart from the healthy worker effect, no. So there isn't a lot of evidence or helpful anecdotes or experience which shows us that hormesis is a useful concept in radiation protection. In fact, it's the other way around. Many official studies have shown that it doesn't have any relevance whatsoever for radiation protection. Then what do you believe led the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to take these three petitions so seriously that they now have them up for public comment and it looks like they are seriously considering replacing linear no threshold with hormesis as the standard for evaluating dangers of radiation exposure? Well, I don't know the answer to that. I've mentioned in the paper that I wrote that it's clear that the NRC must have some sort of discretion to discard frivolous or mischievous or time-wasting petitions. And it's a bit worrying that they have taken these three petitions on board. I don't think it's much use to speculate why they accepted it. What is the danger, then, of the NRC taking these petitions seriously enough to put them up for comment? Well, the dangers are that they may take it seriously and act on it. I hope they don't, but you never know. There are a few things on our side, though, and I hope your listeners will take heart of this. In my report, I've listed about half a dozen or so United States official bodies, which appear to me to be highly questioning of this nonsense about our missiles. Put it this way, a number of their scientists have engaged in studies which show that the LNT is the appropriate model to use. And these are big bodies like, for example, the Centers for Disease Control down in uh, Savannah, Georgia. Oh, sorry, Atlanta, Georgia. There's the NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupation and Safety and Health. There's the United States Department of Energy. There's the United States Environmental Protection Agency. They're listed in the report that I made. These are heavyweight organizations. They've got good scientists working on them. They're not compromised like the NRC. And I'm very much hoping that the NRC will listen to what they have to say. The problem with the NRC, and I say this with the best will in the world, is that they have a very bad track record when it comes to regulating the nuclear industry. Indeed, a number of environmental groups think that instead of regulating the industry, they're basically a promotion outfit. They're the biggest fan club for the nuclear industry. You get no argument here. I don't like saying that, but there's a lot of evidence suggesting that the NRC is very, very badly captured. I mean, basically, the, the old saying is it should be a, a watchdog, but instead it's a lap dog. Well, that metaphor is not strong enough now. The NRC really is rooting and tooting for the nuclear industry. And there's a reason for it, because the American nuclear industry is in decline right now. There's about half a dozen reactors closed down. There's more 
scheduled to close down because they're all, most of the reactors in the United States are past their sell by date and they're going to have to close down. That's basically a certificate for the NRC saying, right, you're going to go as well. And they're fighting for job protection, basically. Well, that's not good enough. Um, that might be all very well for the staffers of the NRC, but it's not good for us. It's not good for people or the environment, which is their slogan uh, about who they're supposed to be protecting. Now, something that it's important for listeners to understand, and that you've referenced a number of times, is this really terrific written report that you have on your website. It's a PDF, which sets out the entire issue here and is a complete refutation to hormesis. What is the report and how can people access it? It's an 11-page report. What it does is it sets out the main arguments that are used by the hormesis advocates. Another phrase for them, by the way, is radiation deniers. Oh, that's a much better one. Thank you. I'll use that from now on. Okay, radiation deniers. I've tried to use less inflammatory language and use the language that would be used by one scientist to another in an official publication. After all, I am a scientist, therefore I have observed the rules of the game. So my report is written as if it had been commissioned by a public body and basically what they want is disinterested views. In other words, unbiased, straightforward, factual findings that isn't highly colored um, or doesn't use, as I say, inflammatory language. What I do is that I look hard at the evidence that is used by or misses advocates to see whether, in fact, it stands up or not. And what I find is that there is a little bit of radiation biology evidence However, it's by no means conclusive. There is just as many studies, in fact even more, which don't show this effect. But, even if it were to accept it, it wouldn't mean anything in terms of radiation protection. It would be irrelevant. And the reasons I give is because, well, we all have exposures to small amounts of radiation every day. Um, much smaller than the amounts used in these radiation biology experiments, by the way a millisievert over a whole year, which is what the background level would be for the gamma radiation, isn't very much radiation. And I put in my uh, report, how would we tell if there were any benefits from this? Well, we can tell. <laughs> and even if we could tell, what would it matter? We can't avoid background radiation. In other words, it's irrelevant. So it sounds like this is false science, bad, put it in quote, science, of a propaganda source to try and push forward an unscientific basis for evaluating radiation dose. Yes, I think that's a good way of putting it. I would say that some people are unable to accept that radiation has, low-level radiation has effects. In particular, in Japan, many Japanese scientists have noticed well over the majority, don't seem to be able to accept that radiation has its low-level effects. What it would do is it would force them to frame Fukushima in a very different way for yes. the populace. And I think that there's tremendous yes. pressure on mm -hmm. the doctors over there and the researchers to yes. not only not tell the truth, but not be able to tell the truth or be challenged, we know in various cases, with losing their ability to practice, losing their funding, losing their job. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. getting back to this report. Apart from mentioning hormesis and basically taking it apart, it also shows the linear no threshold evidence. There's about at least seven or eight studies, and they've all got graphs, and they all show straight lines going down to zero dose. And these studies are, for example, from radiation workers at Chernobyl, they are people who have been exposed to radiation therapists in Canada and the United States, nuclear workers in Britain, people who received radon exposures in Norway and Sweden, and also background radiation too, that's, that's another thing. There's about six examples that I give of where people have received small amounts of radiation and there are very large studies 
that was, these studies cannot be refuted because of uncertainty. These are studies which are very powerful indeed. They've got good, narrow confidence intervals. We can be quite sure that the findings are accurate. In other words, I would say that the evidence is incontrovertible, that the relationship between dose and risk is linear, and it goes all the way down to zero. To access this report, where would they go and what would they have to click on? My website is www.ianfairley.org. And by the way, Ian Fairley is spelled as follows. I-A-M-F-A-I-R... L I E. And if you go into my website, you just type in NRC and it'll come up as well. Ian Fairley, as always, it's a joy to have you here and thank you so much for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Again, it's my pleasure, Libby. All the best for now. That was Dr. Ian Fairley. His report on hormesis what's wrong with it from a scientific analysis, and why it must not be used as a basis for determining radiation health risks, is available on his website, infairly.org, and we'll also have a link to it up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 278. I just want to take a moment to express my appreciation for those of you who do what I call the Starbucks donation to Nuclear Hot Seat, the equivalent of a cup of coffee with a tip to the barista. Have I told you just one of the things that this kind of donation goes for? In social media, reaching out to people who might be interested in what you're doing is hard if you don't already know them or know people that they know. But for just one dollar a day, I can boost a nuclear hot seat post to hundreds of people who wouldn't otherwise know about the show. Even better, I can pre-select for age range, gender, location on the planet, and their interests. I'm being coached on how to do this by a genuine social media expert who is donating his time in order to steer me right on it. What's exciting is that the results are starting to show up in greater reach for the show. So if you would like to sponsor a week of social media boosts, send a donation of $5 or more if you're inspired to do so. I won't stop you. And you can donate by going to the website at NuclearHotSeat.com and clicking on the big red Donate button. PayPal, debit or credit cards, all of that is accepted. And if you prefer to donate by check, we can make arrangements for that too. Be this a one-time boost to the show, or something you take on a monthly basis, whatever you can do to help support the work of Nuclear Hot Seat, merci, gracias, grazie, toda roba, and thank you. A.G. Oguma made the film Tell the Prime Minister, which I found deeply moving as it portrays through YouTube video excerpts what the first days, weeks, and months were like after the March 11, 2011 earthquake and tsunami began the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Oguma is a professor at the Faculty of Policy Management in Keio University in Tokyo. His socio-historical work covers national identity, colonial policy, democratic thinking after World War II, and the Japanese student movement in 1968. He has received seven prizes for his publications and one prize for filmmaking in Japan. Oguma participated in and researched the anti-nuclear movement after the Fukushima accident in 2011, and this is what led him to directing Tell the Prime Minister. I spoke with him from his home in Tokyo via Skype. Eiji Oguma, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. It's my pleasure, yeah. You are an historian and a sociologist. What is your background and what are your areas of expertise? Mainly, I wrote about modern Japanese history, uh, national identity building, and colonial policy, and social movement, and post-democracy thoughts in post-Second World War in Japan. And my work was a mixture of sociology and history. Where were you 
on March 11 of 2011 when the Great Tohoku earthquake happened and the tsunami followed? I was in my residence when I felt the earthquake. I was pleased and my laptop was broken for a chef. Where was your home located? Center of the Tokyo. And how soon after the earthquake and tsunami did you become aware that there was a problem with the nuclear reactors at Fukushima? Yeah, I and my wife and my daughter didn't know that. However, in the TV news in the dinner time, Green, what kind of the problem had happened in nuclear plant? That was fast news for us. And did it make a deep impact on you at that time? I know something on nuclear energy issues, partly because I have studied physics in my student years, and I have experience to participate in the anti-nuclear energy movement right after Chernobyl incident, so that I knew something on nuclear energy problem, so that uh, I felt strong fear. How long after the earthquake and tsunami started the Fukushima disaster did you become aware of the anti-nuclear movement and start thinking about perhaps making a film about it? Right after the disaster, I evacuated from Tokyo with my five years old daughter to Mm. Kyoto. And I spent three weeks in my friend's residence in Kyoto with my five years old daughter. However, I had to go back to Tokyo because I needed to talk with my wife what we should do. In other words, shall we quit our job in Tokyo or not? That was a very serious problem. However, from internet, I got information. A group uh, will organize anti-nuclear rally. So that I decided to attend that. After I attended the rally, I thought to myself, yeah, I was amazed. That was totally different from traditional movement in Japan. So that I decided to make research and observe and participate. And I had published a paper and a book in 2013 it was social background of the participants and the activists and what was the process and so on. However, I couldn't write about, you know, atmosphere of the rallies and also their faces and the tone of the voices. And so that I decided to make film to record their faces and the voices in 2014. So there was a book first. What's the title of the book? That was a Japanese book. We were translated the title of the book, The People Who Try to Stop Nuclear Energy, in Japanese book. I published in my paper, which examined, you know, a social background of the activists and their nature of the groups and how they mobilize the people and impact of the political decision in English also. The title of the English article is A New Wave Against the Rock. A New Wave Against the Rock? Rock is a kind of the old system and a new wave rising against the rock. You clearly state that you do not consider yourself a filmmaker. You never planned to make a film. Was it just your desire to put the faces to the story and put the emotion into the story that got you started? Partly, I decided to make the film because Japanese mass media actually didn't cover the movement. Many of the Japanese people and most of the people in the world don't know much about the movement. And I thought that the the movement was a very huge movement. 200,000 people gathered in front of the Prime Minister's office and finally anonymous activists succeeded to meet with the Prime Minister. And that was the title of the film, Tell the Prime Minister. I'm a historian, so that I felt that was my mission to record historical events. How and when did you get started on the film? How did you decide to proceed with this? 
As I told you, I published a book and a paper in 2013 in Japanese and in 2016 in English. However, I couldn't write about you know, their faces and atmospheres or demonstration. And I stayed in Mexico as a visiting professor in January to March in 2014. I gave lectures for Mexican students on the Japanese modern history, and I taught one class for the Japanese social movement, and I screened internet video for them, and they seemed amazed. And that was when I got my idea. After I returned to Tokyo, I talked with activists and asked the cooperation. And uh, I talked with uh, one engineer. At the same time, he is a cameraman. I and Mr. Engineer. That was all of the stuff. And I collected internet footages and I interviewed, including the Prime Minister at the time and the young CEO, an entrepreneur and a hospital worker and an anarchist and Dutch business person, female and a female illustrator who became the leader of the movement. And a young shock crack female who didn't have any experience to participate in social movements. And fourth female was Fukushima Ibaki, who lived at less than one mile from Fukushima Maban power plant. And so that、uh, I edited all of the interviews and internet footage into a film. Actually, I didn't have any ex- experience to make the film, but、uh, I was a historian. I'm a historian, so that、uh, I have accustomed to you know, correct historical discourses from the documents and、uh, edited into the work or paper. This, such a kind of experience contributed to make film. And also, I'm a sociologist, so that I selected eight interviews very carefully to reflect the diversity of Japanese society, from prime minister to anarchist. From Dutch person to Fukushima Ibaki, and from young CEO to shop clerk. That is the basic composition of my film. What were you looking for in the YouTube videos? Because there are so many of them up there, and I read somewhere that you watched hours upon hours of video. What were you looking for? What captured your attention and made you want to include that material in the film? Actually, I participated in most of the demonstration and the rally which recorded in the film. <laughs> so that I watched many of the internet video in the same time parallel and by participation. So that I knew already which footage should be here and which footage would be here、uh, in internet. After I decided to make the film, I've checked many of the footages And carefully selected, but actually, I knew everything on the movement <laughs> by the process of the participation, so that I didn't feel, you know, how to say it. The movement, as you document it, was still very robust with 200,000 people showing up for that Tokyo rally.、Mm. It was truly、mm. a peak moment. Yet, the movement seems to have fallen off in the years since then. What, in your estimation, is the reason for that? Actually, I think、uh, the movement in Tokyo in 2011 and 2012 was、uh, a kind of the part of the democratic movement in all around the world.、Uh, coincidentally, the movement was、uh, approximately the same time of the Occupy Wall Street movement and the European movement in 2012. And it was two or three years before of Taiwan and Hong Kong umbrella movement and the Sanfara movements. And as I have recorded in the film, many of the activists inspired from the Egyptian revolution. It was January of 2011. And so that I thought from the beginning of the movement, I continued to participate in the movement, observe the movement, because I thought it was a kind of the democratic movement which happened all around the world. So that I focus on the social background of the activists, and many of them came from the so called cognitive precariat. Do you know?、Uh, they are you know, cognitive workers. 
IT designers and music operators and PA operators and so on. That was because the movement was very colorful in music design, cool design placard, and PA system, sound monitoring, and so on. And many of the participants made a speech by PA system. That was because many of the PA operators participated as an activist. Such a kind of cognitive worker, at the same time very precarious. They are highly educated, however, they couldn't get stable jobs. And such a kind of cognitive precariat accumulated all around the world. It's the same goes with US and Europe countries. And I attended the you know, umbrella movement by the help of the coordinator. And uh, I talked with activists of the umbrella movement. Many of them were highly skilled, highly educated, but at the same time, couldn't get several jobs. In Japanese cases, the movement, anti-nuclear energy movement, was triggered by nuclear disaster. However, basic social background was uh, very common. As you may know, Japan will have been suffered from the economic stagnation since 1997, average annual income of the Japanese employees uh, 15% decrease, 1, 5%. In such a circumstances, so-called precarious workers in has increased. That was social background, as I have recorded in the film. From such a kind of view, now we can see in Tokyo, kind of the serialized social movement had been happened. The peak of the anti-nuclear energy movement of the 2012. Your film ends with this terrific demonstration only yeah. 18 months after Fukushima and yeah. the nuclear accident began. Only three months after that, there was a change of administration. In the film, mm. you interviewed Naoto Kan, who was prime minister during Fukushima. And after that, he was followed by Yoshiko Noda. But yeah. Noda lost office and Shinzo Abe, who yeah. has a much different political orientation, came in yes. as of December of 2012. What changes have you seen in the Japanese anti-nuclear movement since Shinzo Abe came into office and specifically since the Japan Secrecy Act was enacted? Yes, Japanese anti-nuclear energy movement now you know, has developed into a part of the democratic movement in Japan. And many of the activists and ordinary participants have started social movement in different topics after 2011. In 2013, big protest movement had happened against secret civil. Uh, Japanese government tried to introduce new law to regulate information. And in last summer, Japanese government tried to change national defense policy. Big protest movement had happened in last summer. And approximately 200,000 people had gathered in front of the national diet. And many of the activists and the audience participants overlapped each other. In last summer, we found 100,000 or 200,000 people shouted. They protest against the change of the national defense policy. At the same time, they protest against the start of the nuclear reactors at the same time. And how has the Secrecy Act impacted the movement. The impact from the secrecy itself was not so strong against the social movements. However, many of the Japanese mass media felt some kind of impact and they have gone to this self-shrinking or self-censorship. Partly because Japanese mass media now losing their self-confidence because of the stagnation of the economy and the decrease of subscribers, and partly because the effect from the internet and the globalization, the traditional mass media losing subscribers. And so they are very fragile against you know, threatening or tacit order from the government and so on. When did you release the film and how have you been distributing it? I finished the film in last summer and I contract with the independent distributor in Japan. The distributor had their own theater. 
The theater in Tokyo screened the film one year since last August, and、uh, they distributed the film all around Japan, and many of the theaters in local cities in Japan、uh, screened the film, and、uh, many of the local community screenings have been organized. And I traveled to European countries in this February and March because I stayed in Berlin as a visiting professor in this February and March. And I visited 16 cities in European countries. I traveled to 10 universities in the US in this September and early October. What has been the response of audiences to the film? I think it was very good. Basically, Many of the audience, including professors and researchers on Japanese contemporary situation, didn't know much about anti nuclear energy in Japan. But many of them seemed surprised. They found the landscape of the 200,000 people gathered in front of the National Diet and Prime Minister's office. Many of them praised the film because it described very Actively, development of the anti nuclear energy movement in Japan. I made the film、uh, very upbeat, not so that the、uh, welcome, I guess. The listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat would be very motivated to view this film. If they wanted to, how can they purchase a copy or arrange for a screening? If you were the Google by the title of the film, Tell the Prime Minister. You can find the official website. You should select the tab of the contact. If you would send email to the distributor, they would distribute film screening materials. And、uh, think about the you know, community, small community screening in foreign countries. Distributor or I myself provide Vimeo link to watch the film for the small community screening. Now I'm talking, you know, with publishing company in Japan. They will publish book with DVD in next year. Eiji Oguma, we wish you every success with the film, and I want to thank you for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Oh, thank you. Sociology and history professor, and now filmmaker, Eiji Ogawa. We'll have a link to his site and information about how you can secure a screening of Tell the Prime Minister. You know where it will be nuclearhotseat.com under this episode, number 278. Activist shout out! I get great support and ideas from listeners. One in particular really got me in the last week. Steve Moyer is a longtime listener. And he sent me a languaging suggestion. You know how I am about languaging. And that is to refer to the nuclear generation of power as atomic fracking. From my perspective, that's not a bad idea. Because in the chain reaction, the atom gets fractured. The results are difficult to control. Unstable material of a destructive nature is released. And sometimes fracking has actually been done using radioactive nuclear waste mixed with cement or mixed in the water. So, atomic fracking. As a phrase, it's possible. What do you think of it? Send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com, whatever your thoughts are on this particular matter. I'd love to know. And here's today's final thought. I've been ruminating on Twitter as digital leafleting, and our need to keep pushing ourselves to learn new platforms, bigger and more powerful platforms, to harness the Internet. Having attended four separate workshops on social media platforms and what they can do while I was at the Excellence in Journalism conference in September, I can tell you that if you have a Facebook account and a Twitter account, that's great. And that's just getting started because there are things we can do with these. There are tools available that can give us more communications power than any of us can currently imagine. And also, ways that plug directly in with how the media is gathering its news. I saw demonstrations of platforms 
that could show you in real time where tweets were trending from any location in the world. They showed us an example with the New York bombings that had happened that weekend and a stack of 36 tweets that came from one block in a very short period of time by physical recognition of the pictures that were on it, by people saying what their location was. I don't even know if it had a hashtag yet. In that way, someone in the media, say CNN, could just pop through, click on whoever that person was, tweet to them or find their cell phone number somehow and ask them if they can be interviewed about what they are witnessing in that movement. Really powerful. There's another platform I saw that would give you access to all tweets within a stated radius, and you get to say how wide it is, of an address or a zip code. Imagine having every tweet in the radius of, say, a nuclear reactor or a state house. These are pieces that are already in play in the media, and I'm sure by law enforcement and the NSA and all the rest. But we can potentially have access to it to be able to use for our ends. So I'm thinking of putting together a training, maybe a series of them specifically for activists who want to better know how to position themselves so the media actually pays attention to what we're saying. It's another set of tools for our toolbox, along with the truth, our big hearts, and this indomitable need we have to not let the world go down in radioactive flames without you and me and all the others in this movement doing whatever we can do to stop it. I don't know if I will do it as a nuclear hot seat or as a side event, but there's info to share We've got to know how to use it to our advantage, and I'm obviously the messenger in this. Details will follow. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, October 18, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from miningawareness.wordpress.com, wsj.com, deunrenard.wordpress.com, reuters.com, asahi.com, Ecological Options Network, eon3.net, AP News, azdeq.gov, patch.com, nj.com, bloomberg.com, knoxnews.com, thehill.com, ridgewoodblog.org, reformer.com, aunews.yahoo.com, abc.net.au, independent.co.uk, globeandmail.com, dailynews.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the brilliant, compassionate, heart-centered souls, and God, aren't they good-looking, in the anti-nuclear movement all over the world. Those people who gather at the Nuclear Hot Seat site on Facebook, which you are all invited to come to, to join us, to like us, and share your posts about nuclear with your friends and family. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. If you've got a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that the last thing any anti-nuclear activist wants to be able to say is, I told you so. That's because we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So do not go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.